Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Great. My name is Christine Pomeranz. I'm the chair of the Department of International Trade and Marketing for the Fashion Industries at the Jay and Patty Baker School of Business and Technology at Fashion Institute of Technology. And I'm pleased to welcome our strong panel uh, who will discuss with us today the African fashion and international business, creative economies powered by capacity building, education, entrepreneurship, women, empowerment, and innovation. And so just to introduce uh, to you a little bit about our program, we're turning 20 years old this year, so we're very happy to do that. Um, FIT turned 75, or 70 last year, and uh, so we're sort of like just emerging from our teenage years. And we have 300 students, uh, over 1,300 alumni, and we prepare our students for management positions in international trade and global fashion and other companies. And so um, when they graduate, our students become coordinators or managers or directors or senior officers in sourcing, marketing, management, education, research, customs, uh, name it, our students do it. They also have ventured into other industries uh, beyond fashion. And so this is, uh, what we call the Talking Trade at FIT guest lecture series. We are on our 23rd season. Uh, we've had over 50 uh, lectures and almost 200 speakers, all distinguished. So uh, we're very lucky to have our illustrious panel today uh, on that. And uh, so uh, it's wonderful to have this event kick off our 20th anniversary. And without further ado, I would now like to invite Kibonen Fee, uh, our mistress of ceremonies for today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for honoring our invitation. And today, um, we are gonna be talking about something very passionate to me. It's a coincidence I was called up to be the MC, but um, the bottom line of this is when you're passionate about something, it just sprinkles out in the universe and you get called up to defend that thing at every now and then. So um, um, when we talk about globalization, we talk about the fashion industry, we talk about Africa, we begin to ask ourselves so many questions about it. We wanna know what part Africa plays in this. We wanna know how the African economies can benefit from this. We want to know how the people in Africa can also benefit from this. And um, this topic, I feel it's not a better time. It has never been a better time to address this topic than now. And um, I'm going to be introducing the members of the panel. I'm not going to talk much about the topic, but I believe this is the time we should address what's happening, fashion. Africa, the people, the economies. And if we realize in countries like China, um, manufacturing, the apparel industries have been very, very vital in um, the development of the, of the country. And um, why is that not the same thing in Africa? We begin to ask ourselves, what's going on? What's wrong? You know, what should we do? What are we doing wrong? What can we do differently? So um, it's with this that I'm gonna introduce the first speaker. And the first speaker is gonna be Roberta. And Roberta is um, the board chairman for Freinlein Company. And um, Freinlein deals a lot with um, development and African fashion, empowerment of the people, especially the women. And she's gonna be talking to us about um, her viewpoint, what she thinks and what she thinks the steps could be towards um, us making the African fashion industry a global industry. Thank you. Thank you, Kiboni, for the introduction. Um, again, thank, uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Roberta Anan, originally from Ghana. Um, I am the founder of Fralan, which is a um, sales and marketing um, business that is looking at expanding the global footprint of African luxury brands. A year ago, we launched our nonprofit arm, which is the African Fashion Fund. And our aim is to bring African brands across the borders and to markets like the US, Europe, Middle East, but 
we realized that there are several issues or challenges that prevent us from doing that. So we started the Fashion Fund, and the focus is to build capacity of African designers, provide them with the skills and training necessary for them to be able to meet the demand of the Western market. We also provide them with education, which is important, which is why we're here today. Um, because you get the creative skills, um, lots of talented folks in the creative industry in Africa, but they don't have, I would say, they need to combine the creative skills with the business acumen so they can, com can basically look at Ferlan as an avenue to be able to do that. So we can be the business that helps you to meet your orders, to meet with retailers, to position yourself properly in the market so that you are competitive because you're not just considered an African brand. You're actually, when you are selling in Barney's, the expectations are very high and you need to be able to meet those demands and that's where we come in. So that's why we launched the Fashion Fund and we're focusing on promoting education because we believe that designers should also have the necessary training to be able to combine that with their um, creative abilities. Um, there's also an element of the Africa Fashion Fund, which is more long-term, which is be really to help with production and manufacturing. Because we believe that production and manufacturing in Africa is important. We need to definitely be able to look at the se several levels of the value chain and add value on the continent and take finished products overseas rather than just exporting our creative skills or even like raw materials. So this is value addition on the continent, bringing production and manufacturing, providing assistance and grants to designers so that they're able to meet the demands of you know the West. Because if you, for instance, if we are able to get orders for a designer and a retailer like Barney's, we need to be able to meet that demand. And capital is often you know an issue, and that's why designers aren't able to do that. So we are working on providing them with grants so that they can meet those high um, orders that they get from high-end high retailers overseas. So production and manufacturing, education and capacity building and training is what the Fashion fo um, Fund focuses on. This year we launched um, a, a program with DC Fashion Foundation, which is the incubator program. and. We are finalizing our um, participation with a young designer in Ghana who is very talented and is going to do an entire year um, and to be able to get this, you know, right skill set, mentorship as, an, as a retail outlet like that, I think it's really tremendous. And he's able to come back to the continent and share, you know, his perspective and lessons as he's learned by being at Macy's. And to us, it's really important to give that global exposure so that you can add that to your creative abilities and expand your business. Um, last year, we also participated in a program with Eden, which is part of the LVMH group. I believe that's where this collaboration actually started here on this platform when I spoke at FIT um, with Janice Sullivan, who is then the CEO of Eden, and we decided we're going to do something together to build the capacity of designers on the continent. So she offered a six-month internship for a Nigerian designer, Kenneth Eze. And, you know, I, I interviewed this designer after his internship, and I was really impressed, because when I met him at Lagos Fashion Week, he, he has a creative talent, all right, but after the internship, he was like, Roberta, I'm able to source fabric you know, at cheaper rates, I'm, I'm able to bargain, I'm able to, you know, like even pattern cutting is different. I've learned so much here in the six months and I'm able to go back to Africa and do a collection which I can call luxury, which has the quality and that's what made me happy. I was very excited about that opportunity because his collection that he presented when we picked him up in Lagos was so different from the collection that he did after Eden. So these are the opportunities we're talking about for the AFF, um, and we really need to find ways to collaborate with institutions like FIT so that we can bring more students here. Even when they're doing the training, they can take formal classes, you know, so that they can learn the business of fashion, which is what we, you know, I'm sure the speakers will touch on that um, later, so I won't go into too, too much detail. And we also launched another program, which is dear to my heart, which is UN Women, and that's Women Empowerment. So we joined the women, UN Women um, Merchandising Program, 
where we're going to be given proceeds of sales that we make um, to the UN to support women empowerment in initiatives. Because I know, being somebody who comes from the UN background, I worked with the UN before I got into fashion. I don't have a fashion background, but I'm definitely passionate about development and passionate about Africa. And I got, I always say that I kind of got introduced to fashion by somebody that I respect tremendously, Franca Sozani, who was like, I'm going to, she's taking this wonderful journey into Africa to reposition how people perceive fashion and luxury in Africa. And I joined that project as a project developer, somebody that is just a connector who is making arrangements for her to interview people. And I learned so much doing that, and I realized that there were challenges you know, on the continent. And in my own way, I wanted to find a solution to that because I'm a problem solver, I'm a scientist. <laughs> so, and being, trying to solve problems in the fashion industry is not the easiest because there are expectations. So these are all things that one needs to bear in mind. But because of that exposure to the fashion industry, I realized that the creative skills on the continent needs to cross the borders and people need to see what is available. People need to take out that connotation of heritage when we're talking about African brands. They need to look at brands as luxury brands that could sell in Barney's, that in Bergdorf Goodman, in high-end retailers that could compete with the Donna Karens <laughs> and the Roberta Cavallis. And I think Africa has the potential to do this with the right investment in individuals, the right investment. We need inv human capital and we need financing. We need partnerships and collaboration. And the education part is also very, very important. So I'll just end here. I was actually meant to give remarks. I think I've gone a bit overboard. But I will invite our speaker, um, the next speaker, who is basically an example of what we're talking about here. She's a shoe designer. She's a banker by day, shoe designer. Um, she manufactures her products in Africa and in the UK. But she's an example of you know, what we are trying to push, the agenda that we're trying to push here. So I'm very excited that she's with us and she's able to share her experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. So my name is Efia Dabanka. I was actually born and raised in Germany um, by Ghanaian parents. Um, traveled to Ghana a lot. Um, as a young girl, like every young girl, we're obsessed with shoes, and I just had this love for shoes. But growing up with African parents, you know, you know you can't really come home and say you want to become a designer. You need to do banking economics, that kind of thing. So anyway, I did the whole banking route, economics route, but there came a time where I just figured, I want to do this, so what will hurt? So um, I embarked on the journey, created my label, Mosaic, roughly four years ago. Very small, started up in Italy, and this was actually a capacity building program as well with the government, um, because back in, well, still, the Italian shoe industry is on a decline because of China, because of Spain, so of everything. So I was working with the Italians, creating my shoe collections, but as you know, there were a lot of challenges as well, because as a startup, you don't have that much funding. You can't, um, you know, deliver the huge orders which they're demanding, and there was a language barrier. I had a lot of requests, bespoke requests from a lot of customers in Nigeria, in Ghana, even UK, a lot of brides and bridesmaids and things like that, but I couldn't fulfill them because the factories were just not playing with me. So I looked in the UK and found a great uh, factory, um, hosted, was run by people from Cyprus. Um, started, so I kind of like started again two years ago, created my, did a, did a more bespoke kind of aspect was doing collaborations with designers and was focusing on, you know, brides and bridesmaids and coming out with these crazy collections because I could do it with them. Anyway, to cut a long story short, during that time, my vision was always I wanted to be the person who can create a luxury shoe made by an African in Africa. That was my main thing. Now, we know with shoes, it's a very special trade. So there are not that many people in Africa who can actually create, let's say, heels. I focus on heels for now. But 
um, that kind of didn't deter me. So one day I called up my sister who was sitting there and I said, just because we can't do heels, let's try and do sandals. Let's do something easy, which, which they can do. Ghana, because um, I'm from Ghana, they have a manufacturing industry, or not a manufacturing industry, but they know how to do sandals, basic sandals. So we started that label last year. But on top of that, because I, I kind of like, I don't like to give up. I'm like, there's something I can do with my heels, but still use the local craft. So I found a wood carver and had him carve wood heels and then used the local artisan, Papa Pong, who's on the Fashion Fund program to create, um, we created a design and he hand painted the designs onto my wood heels. And we presented that in Italy last year. Amazing success, great feedback. Um, and I think working with the artisans and the people in Ghana where I was, the joy these, these artisans have, the raw skills they have. We have a lot of skills, but I find they're very raw. We had to sit, I had to sit in the factories, in the carving industry for, from morning to evening to make sure that everything is done correctly. Because simple things like stamping the name into the sole, they would use eye measurements, but eye measurement is not good enough for Italy, for the US, for the UK. It's just not good enough. Stitching, you know, they cut corners, but it's not their fault um, because they don't have the training. They don't have um, the exposure to what is required on the international scale. I mean, there's a factory in, in Ethiopia at the moment. Um, they're working, again, it's under capacity program, they're working on tie and dye on leather, they're using smock, um, fab, um, smock techniques on leather fabrics, which is amazing, and they can only do that with the help, with the support from, you know, Africa Fashion Fund, other organizations. For me, personally, it's an amazing experience, but again, I'm self-funded, so I fund everything by myself, but there's a limit you can go, so I still work during the day. Um, and do this kind of like banker by day, you know, designer by night, I kind of like call it. But for me, it's, 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 I'm so passionate about it and I want to make this thing work, however it is. You can take fabrics from, from um, anywhere in Africa. You can take accessories. You can work with the artisans to create glass beads, whatever it is, to combine and create your collections here. I'm not saying that everything has to be made there, but if there are certain aspects you can take, especially for the shoe industry. Fashion is slightly different, the clothing, because people can sew and whatever, but when it goes to shoes, the, the construction is so detailed for heels, one has to be careful, or you have to find the right people. I'm not gonna give up, my ultimate aim is to find that factory who can do it. Um, but yeah, we're gonna need help. I'm funding it by myself, so. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, but I'm not going to give up. And that's why, you know, when I met Roberta two years ago, I was telling her of my pain and my challenges. Um, and that's why we teamed up. So I'm glad to be part of Fralane and Fashion Fund, and I'm excited of where this is going to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Afua. Thank you. That was so spot on. And I believe your example is one of the biggest challenges we all go through producing out of Africa. Sometimes you just want to cry. Like, why don't you get this? It feels sometimes like you move away from the person who is on the sewing machine or on the product, and it's another story, you know? I mean, you're talking about staying in the factories an entire day. I did that to the point where I even collapsed, because I could not even move to go eat because they will do something else. You know, it's such a, it's a very deep problem. And like you say, you cannot blame them. But I would just want to hold us more accountable for what we are doing. We cannot go with any more excuses. Nobody's trying to hear any excuse. It's either you present, present the right thing, or you go home. And we have to be real about it. We cannot keep giving excuses for not doing it right. And I believe that it is time for us to take the steps, the necessary steps, to make sure we are doing it right. So um, I'm going to introduce um, a lady whom I think I met before. I met in the process of still expressing my, 
my passion for you know fashion in Africa and fashion in the continent and how it can be done right because I was just tired of it not being right and um, this lady Stephanie Cords is going to be talking on the investors perspective to the entire scenario Stephanie So I'm Stephanie Cordes, Vice Chair of the Cordes Foundation, which is my family foundation that we started back in 2009 when my dad sold his investment services company. Him and my mom came together and philanthropy was always something they were really passionate about. And so they started the foundation and I decided to join in 2014, but this was after a long journey of always wanting to do something in the fashion and media industry and throughout my whole college experience. I had different internships with designers and magazines, but it wasn't until I attended our annual poverty alleviation retreat called the Opportunity Collaboration that I really wanted to become more involved in the impact side, and so I decided to join full-time the foundation last year. And at first I thought that I was leaving the fashion industry to get into the social impact space, but since I've realized that you can really use fashion as a force for good and combine both fashion and impact to create change. The economic empowerment of women. And we believe that's really important for the progress of society. And the impact, the economic impact of the fashion industry is highly underestimated. It's the second largest global industry at $1.5 trillion. Artisanship is the second largest employer in the world, roughly employing 70 million people, three fourths of them being women. Then again, human trafficking is the second largest criminal industry in the world. And 70% of that is labor trafficking. So we think that it's important to empower these 50 million women at the bottom of the pyramid and co by connecting them with the global marketplace so they aren't subjected to this vulnerability and put into trafficking. And many foundations use that 5% towards traditional grants and aid in nonprofit organizations, which we do as well. We work with an organization called Nest that has capacity building workshops for artisans and Fair Trade USA, my dad is the board chair of. But we believe it's that other 95% of our assets and that's the investments in for-profit social enterprises. That's what's really going to create change. So I'm just going to explain two of the ones that we have today in Africa that are really important to us in two different asset classes. And one is private debt and all across Africa. And this is a company that is taking artisans and training them and creating their products and selling them in a unique distribution at pop-up kiosks in Costco. And they actually started as a nonprofit and decided that as they wanted to expand and continue their impact across more countries in Africa, they switched into a for-profit called All Across Africa. And then another one is in a company called Soko that uses design and innovation to connect artisans to the global marketplace. Right now they're working in Kenya, specifically in Nairobi, with a network of a thousand artisans. And they've already increased the artisans' wages by five times. And the artisans get 30% of the profit price. This is a particularly exciting one for me because I had actually bought a piece of their jewelry before I even knew the social mission. And I think that that's important in fashion is to continue putting the product first. And as more people continue to buy it, it ripples through the impact. One example of how we like to connect organizations in our portfolio is how we connected SOCO, which is a for-profit, to Pencils of Promise, which is a non-profit. And every time you buy one of their pieces of jewelry, 20% goes back to Pencils of Promise. So the product is not only changing, is the product alone is not changing a life, but it is building schools that can. And I would just like to show a quick...
So that was just um, an example of how we've connected two of our partners that we care deeply about. One that empowers artisans and one that builds schools in Africa and together buying these beautiful jewelry pieces is helping to improve lives of the children and of the families. And one of the reasons why we invest in fashion and in Africa is we believe that investing in ethical fashion is not only investing in good business, but it's investing in improving the lives of women, their families, and the community in which we all live. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I feel like I've heard this before, and um, it's a good feeling, you know, knowing that you're actually making the steps and making progress in it. It's really great. And um, when we look at initiatives like this, it keeps us thinking and figuring out how do we continue to make this, you know, a, a expand this. You know, Stephanie could be one of the several people who could be out there who are willing and and ready to do things that are going to impact the fashion scene in Africa. And I know for a fact that they are definitely looking for the right collaborations, the right people, and we here could just be like the perfect resources, you know, to tap into that network so it can be a bigger chain and create a more sustainable um, situation for, for fashion in Africa. And um, right now I'm going to introduce a group that has also taken particular interest in working and helping to develop um, fashion in Africa, really particularly in terms of capacity building and education. So I'm going to invite um, the RAI group uh, next on the panel to tell us what they got. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today I'd like to introduce you a little more in depth to the African Fashion Fund. African fashion and international business, creative economies powered by capacity building, education, entrepreneurship, women's empowerment and innovation. These are all things that we look to for solutions when we look at this gap that we're experiencing as far as African fashion and the inclusion in the global market. So as you know, it was started by the fabulous Roberta Annan. Uh, we're a non-for-profit organization. And um, what we're doing here is we're supporting emerging designers, not only with capacity building, but we're opening new doors for these designers in the global market. Um, more than inclusion, we want an overall fusion of African design in the global market. As far as luxury brands are concerned, we are very excited for the luxury industry in Africa. It's growing tremendously, and our biggest mission is to get these designers into intern placements, to really hone in on quality control, um, with manufacturing and production on the continent and assist with grants and scholarships to make those possible as far as exchange programs go. Um, with high industry, high profile industry exposure, what we're able to do for these designers is to get them on a level with luxury internationally that is needed. We don't see enough attention being given to African design. Uh, we see a lot of it going into the actual materials, uh, the prints, uh, the different resources that come from the continent, but we're really not focused on the designers themselves. So the foundation, that, that's our biggest focus, is to grow these designers. Here we see um, Kenneth's one of Kenneth's pieces, and as Roberta stated earlier, his piece is much different than when he started the program with Eden. Uh, Papo Pung, he's just getting started, and we look forward to him coming to the States and being a part of the DC Fashion Incubator in partnership with Macy's. As Roberta stated earlier, this young designer will be able to sell his brand through Macy's. 
and with them as a larger conglomerate um, for exposure, Macy's in New York City is really a staple for fashion here. Um, we're able to see ready to wear um, as well as things that are coming off of the runway. So we look forward to that particular partnership, but that's one of the, one of the biggest examples that we have at African Fashion Fund for that particular exposure and inclusion. As far as uh, our partnership with you and women, it's also very exciting. We're able to open up that, that sense of philanthropy, giving back, um, with fashion, but you and women, it's a very unique process that we're going through with them. The designers, even though they're making things that may be a bit more pricey, those uh, pieces of those percentages are going back toward you and women um, and different programs that we are also partnering to support as far as women's empowerment which is extremely important as far as the work that is being done on the ground for production and manufacturing. We're finding that there are so many women artisans and they all teach each other. And so if we can integrate a higher level of skill, we're able to then produce quality control. And that's something that we all are looking forward to seeing coming out of the continent. But it's something that really needs to be worked on. It's something that we need to come together with, with partnerships to truly cultivate. So here are our tags. And you guys can find us on social media, follow us. Um, we're everywhere you would want to be for African fashion. And we're really grateful to have this space and have this opportunity to share um, what the fund's all about here at FIT. Uh, this is a very uh, important education institution here in the United States for fashion. And we look forward, again, to integrating our students and our designers in these programs to make the industry more fluid coming out of Africa. So we thank you for being here today. We thank you for listening. We thank you for taking it in. And we hope that we can create more partnerships to make this industry grow. So I thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for the work you're doing. Wow. That not heard about you, but I'm really impressed. I'm really, really impressed. Um, and I'm even more impressed because um, there are some things that's ju that just have to be done. You know, you have the connections, you have meet the right people, move on and get things done. And um, my little contribution, besides being an, the MC of this event, I'm equally a fashion designer. And um, I've worked for five years producing out of Cameroon. And um, I'm not gonna say it's been a nightmare. I'm not, actually I'm not saying that, but it's been really, really challenging. And um, after I worked in Cameroon for about three years, because I started fashion just by not knowing anything about fashion. I was just passionate about it. I made a dress for myself, which was beautiful. And then I had so many people loving it and they started ordering it. And I was like, wow, this could actually be great. And, but this dress was very particular to my hometown. It's like the traditional regalia, which we wear in Cameroon. And I thought it could really, you know, be a great seller. And I got into it, you know, guessing, reading books, watching YouTube, and I was like, whoa, this is what I want to do. So when I was made redundant in 2009, I was like, you know what, let me just focus on, on this and get it done. And I started figuring out ways of, you know, growing the brand and developing the brand. But my soul, my major, what was so important to me was how can I use the talent, which is very important to the women in my hometown, you know, this talent was the embroidery which they do on the garments. So that embroidery was just amazing, colorful, beautiful. And um, I realized that they could act, if I do it and I sell it out there, they could get more jobs. So I continued doing it. And to be honest with you, maybe before they would make a garment, embroider it with this beautiful um, 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 embroidery for like, say if it were $5 or $10, 
Whoa, after he got international, a couple of celebrities wore it here and there. Believe me, these women would charge you $25 to get it made. I was happy because I was like, wow, they are now seeing the importance of this. And that is where, you know, the way I look at it. We could have skills and talents, but if they are not made to see it as amazing, they would never appreciate the value for it. And that is where some of us who've been out, learned, and, you know, understand how it's done out there have to be able to take it back to the people there. I am really big on the sustainability aspect of it. I mean, and sustainability for me, I'm looking at it more from the angle of, of it being a long lasting industry. You know, when we come into the fashion industry and we look, we, we, we start taking things from a particular level, the bottom is still not founded. The bases are still not there. You know, the people whom we are sitting with for hours still don't have that basic thing at the bottom, which is that education. You know, and we, we tend to look at it just from the point of view of it being an artisan perspective, but how about it being an education, which would go for years? Because what I noticed is the people are talented, but they need direction. They need it, they need to cultivate it. Even my parents do not support the fact that I'm a fashion designer. Am I gonna explain that to them any further just by my successes? However, I discovered I was this talented way later in my life. How about we start cultivating the younger ones, you know, the ones we can identify as being talented, building the industry in a way that parents can actually agree that their children should go study fashion and call it fashion and not tailoring, you know, and sewing, you know, and make it more interesting for the millennials, for the younger generation, because they are hungry. You know, they know how to do stuff, the computer, everything, it's great. but. Why don't they just treat the fashion industry like this prestigious you know, university I'm going to? Imagine a student coming to FIT, it's the talk of that student's life. But you cannot tell a kid in Africa you're gonna go learn sewing. Oh my God, that kid would cry and not talk to the parents for a long time. So that is for me, the angle that we also have to look at when we are looking at fashion. How can we make it when, when you leave high school, oh, I'm going to university. Oh, I'm going to fashion school, you know, like what happens here. So I'm really counting on collaborations with schools like FIT, you know, to work with us in different parts of Africa. Right now, currently, we have a lot of fashion schools in South Africa, you know, and they are producing great designers in South Africa. When you look at the fashion industry, amazing designers have come from South Africa. The David Lales, Tula Cindy's, um, La Duma, you know, they're doing great because they had that, you know, enabling environment that helped them even develop those skills. So that is the food for thought. I'm not saying we have to do it, but we really have to look at it from that angle. Because if we can start from there, we are creating a longer term, you know, it's gonna be more sustainable, more practical, and we're gonna get a lot of the people who have to be involved, more involved. Thank you so much for this platform. Thank you so much, Roberta. And um, I think Roberta is gonna give us a closing remark. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna invite you to tell us something about what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today about a topic I'm very passionate about. What I'm going to do is bring everything together from what everybody has been talking about, and I'm focusing exclusively on the business of fashion. We're going to examine different parts of it and talk about what the real challenges are and how we can address those challenges. I'm speaking to you today as an ambassador and an advocate for the fashion industry in Africa. I am an individual who believes that fashion is a tool that can be used to express oneself to gain understanding of others and can be used as a tool for empowerment. And that you can hear a lot of us have mentioned that throughout um, this panel. To me as a student and a consumer of fashion, fashion is very simplistic. It is extremely individualistic and it's an extremely powerful tool that is not being utilized like it should in Africa right now. Officially, I'm here um, today as a board member of Frillin, an organization founded by Roberta Anna and it's focused on helping African designers with capacity building and getting their products placed with global retailers. The fashion industry in Africa has experienced tremendous growth in the past 10 years. 
However, when compared to other, to other parts of the world, it is still lagging behind. A lot has been said and written about the fashion industry in Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa, just to name a few countries in Africa. But the question that constantly comes to mind to me whenever I read anything about the industries and also being someone in the industry is, uh, is the fashion industry in these countries, are they living up to their potential? If not, what are the challenges that are preventing it from being a viable and profitable industry like it is in the US or other parts of the world? And when we talk about fashion generally, rarely do people immediately think about the business or the economics of fashion. People tend to think of the glitz and the glamour side of it. In order to address the questions um, that I mentioned, I'm going to use Nigeria as a case study to examine the fashion industry in, in Africa. I'm Nigerian, uh, I should say I'm Nigerian American. And um, I recently actually uh, relocated to Nigeria last year. So I've had the opportunity to interact with many designers and get a front row seat to some of the amazing things going on in Nigeria and some of the challenges a lot of these designers have to face on a daily basis. For those in the audience who might not be too familiar with Nigeria, let me start by providing some macroeconomic indicators of Nigeria. So first, Nigeria is the largest population in Africa, approximately 175 million people. There are a lot of us. <laughs> we account for 47% of West Africa's population. Nigeria is the biggest economy in Africa and the 26th largest economy in the world with a GDP of $509 billion. It is the largest oil producing country in Africa with over 2.5 million barrels of oil produced on a daily basis. And historically, this has been the key driver um, of the economy. Unemployment rate is at 24%. Interest rate is at 25%, which is extremely high. And inflation rate is 8%. Now that I've given you some context about the economy in Nigeria, I'm going to go back to the question I mentioned earlier. Is the fashion industry in Nigeria living up to its potential? If not, what are the problems that are present, preventing, excuse me, the fashion industry in Nigeria from being a viable and vibrant industry? The first, my answer to the first question would be yes and no. The fashion industry includes many moving parts. And for us to really understand the industry, we have to look at the value chain from a very holistic perspective. And when you look at the different segments of the value chain, each segment has to be scored independently because some, are striving and some have regressed significantly in the past several years. So let's start out with the first, purchasing and sourcing. You're talking about sourcing for raw materials and the production of those raw materials to actual fabrics people can use. Sourcing for raw materials in Nigeria has improved. Why? Because of the ongoing success of the agriculture um, sector in Nigeria. The past administration placed a huge focus on agriculture and the new administration in Nigeria is going to do the same. So what this has done is it's made the access to raw materials slightly easier, not necessarily easy, but easier, and more at reasonable prices compared to what it was in the past. But now you now talk about having access to raw materials. How do you take these raw materials and make them to fabrics that designers can actually use? The problem with that is when it comes to textile production in Nigeria, you have, you don't, you have very, very, very few producers in Nigeria for textile production. I would say for me, I, have, I can relate to that personally because growing up, although my mother is a pharmacist, my mom has a factory where she actually produces fabrics. And I can see how it was more of a bigger focus when I was growing up versus to what it is now because of the cost of production in Nigeria is very, very high. And what that has done is it's forced local producers not to be able to produce to the capacity that they would love to. So for a lot of designers, what does that mean? That means limited option for locally produced fabrics, and they'll rather go abroad to other countries to source um, their fabrics. So that means when it comes to pur purchasing and sourcing, it's a segment in the value chain that's not doing so well and needs a lot of improvement. And in order for that to happen, you need, I would probably say to a significant um, extent, you need government intervention for certain policies to be put in place to enable local production. And you also need individuals, you need um, capital injection that makes it possible for local producers to actually produce. Then the second segment, we talk about production and manufacturing. I think Roberto mentioned this and other panelists have also discussed this. One thing Africa is not lacking and Nigeria is not any different is we have many talented designers. We have many established designers and a lot of up and coming designers who are incredible. I mean, case in point, the piece I'm wearing today is by a Nigerian designer, Wana Sambo. And um, I would say 80% of my wardrobe now is by African designers because I truly believe in 
what they can do. So when it comes to having that creativity, how do you conceptualize an idea and actually translate it to a piece? We have no problem in that area because we have a lot of extremely talented designers. You have some who have formal training and you have a lot as well who have come into the industry because they have a natural flair for, um, for designing. So this is a segment we're doing very well in, but it's also probably the most challenging segment as well because of the production of a collection for designers. Why is this a challenge? Lack of funds. Very few designers can actually afford to be able to create a full collection. And um, I think a lot of people have alluded to this earlier as well. You have the lack of skilled labor. It, it requires personally training a lot of these tailors. I mean, I've had conversations with many designers in Nigeria where they say that due to the lack of skilled labor in Nigeria, what they have to do is go to neighboring countries to actually bring in tailors from neighboring countries. But what does that mean? It adds to their production cost because they have to provide accommodation and transportation for those, for those tailors while they're in Nigeria. And, I mean, going back to what we've talked about in terms of education, we need institutions in Nigeria, and like I said, using Nigeria as a case study in other African countries that would teach a lot of, um, I'll probably say like a lot of designers, how do you take, I mean, in terms of like the quality control as well, that's another thing that's a major issue for us in the industry. And but that goes back to what we mentioned earlier, is when you have lack of skilled labor, you can have an amazing designer who's the back, who are the backbones of the industry, but at the end of the day, they need help. So how do they go from saying, okay, you know what, I have this fantastic piece I want to create, and you don't have the right skilled labor in place to be able to help you translate that. Then apart from that, that um, inevitably affects the finishing and the quality of the product at the end of the day. So this is an area that we really need help in and um, capital injection in this particular area. And that's why I really believe in an organization like Ferlin because it's really helping to raise funds for local designers to be able to bring their dreams to life and also in the end of the day really make the fashion industry a viable um, industry. Um, okay, then, okay, the next segment, excuse me, the third segment is distribution. If you look at, when we talk about distribution, you can have a piece that you've created. Now, how do you get this piece to the end user? This is one area I would say Nigeria has improved in significantly in the past several years because you have many outlets. E-commerce is one of the most vibrant um, industries in Nigeria right now. You have several outlets where you can purchase, um, purchase pieces from. Retailers, I mean, the retail landscape in Nigeria is going through a very, very interesting period right now. You have a lot of new retailers that are coming into the space that are really setting a new standard. I mean, game changers in the retail space in Nigeria. You have a lot. You have influx of luxury um, luxury brands that are actually coming into the marketplace. So what that is doing is also forcing retailers to say, you know what? If a Louis Vuitton wants to come to Nigeria, if a Dolce Gabbana wants to come to Nigeria. They expect the space to be of the same standard of inter as international standards. So what that does for retailers is retailers are forced to create that space if they want to accommodate those designers. So you can see that in the retail space in Nigeria that I say this is a segment that there's still room for improvement. There's definitely room for improvement because we don't necessarily have like your high street retail space. Um, a lot of the retail stores in Nigeria are standalone, but there are a lot of um, up and coming projects that I'm, that I'm aware of that will bring everyone together. So this is a space that a lot of people are actually already taking strides to improve this area. Then you talk about marketing and sales, and um, this is an area where I say we're doing okay. Not great, but okay. You have your magazines, you have your, I mean, PR companies. Um, we have a fashion week in Nigeria as well. But the fashion week in Nigeria is very different from the fashion week in New York. You know, you don't necessarily have your buyers coming in to come and view the collection and say, I want to place an order for the collection. Why? Does the designer have the financial capability to fulfill an order if an order is placed? So if you look at it, all these problems are all interconnected. So, and it's like a domino effect. It's if you don't address one problem, one problem affects every single area. So we can put on a fabulous um, show and you have designers showcasing their collection for the world to see. By the end of the day, why you're showcasing your collection? Because you want people to place orders and actually buy it. But going back to, if, you're, if you don't have that capital to be able to fulfill that order, then that means all you're doing is you're selling one piece here, one piece there, because of the type of, I would say, professional buyers and professional institutions who will buy your collection, you don't have that capital to be able to fulfill their order. 
So um, then the final part, which I think is very important, and that's why I'm glad um, to be here to be speaking today, is um, the last segment is services. It's, I call it the segment where um, Africa has to become part of the global conversation about um, the global fashion industry conversation. When we talk about Africa, and I think um, we've mentioned this numerous times, a lot of African designers make fantastic pieces that can compete with the best of the best in the world. And I look forward to the day when an African designer will be talked about and they're not called an African designer. It's, this is a fantastic designer who made an incredible piece and they'll be viewed that way. And I think this, I mean, and this is like, I put this burden on everybody that not only do designers have to tell their story over and over again about, this is my brand, yes, I'm influenced by um, where I'm from, my origin being African, by the end of the day, I am an amazing designer who makes fantastic shoes, who makes fantastic ready to wear, and that's the way I should be viewed. Then also I think um, the second part of services to me is the knowledge sharing within the industry. I would love to see African designers for us to have um, an association that brings all the designers together where they can leverage off each other, they can learn together, try to figure out how can we have an association that helps the industry in tackling the problems they're facing. So I've highlighted some of the challenges that, um, that are currently inhibiting the industry from being a viable one and living up to its potential. However, as I speak, I know many stakeholders in the industry that are working towards addressing some of these challenges. An example like I gave is like the organization that I'm representing today, Ferlin. You know, um, you have African fashion funds establishing funds for local designers. You have the creation of new um, outlets for distribution. And you have other individuals as well who have taken it upon themselves to focus on how do we encourage and institute a industry-wide quality and control. That's just to name a few of some of the ongoing initiatives that many individuals, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa as a whole, are working on. The fashion industry is the second largest employer after agriculture in most developing countries, and a large percentage of this workforce are women. We all know research shows that empowering and investing in a woman has a cumulative bonus. It, women, women are likely to spend their income on their children, on families, on education, on health and nutrition. This inevitably infects, affects the social and economic development of a country. So this makes it very, very apparent for us that we have to get this right. This is an industry that presents a huge opportunity for economic development, not just in Nigeria, but in other countries in Africa. The viability of the industry is dependent on the collaborative effort of all stakeholders. This is applicable to the fashion industry in Nigeria, in other countries in Africa, and I say the fashion industry as a whole, globally. I believe that we're going to get this right if I look at where the fashion industry in Africa was five years, from, five years ago and look at where it is today. I'm very, very confident that five years from now we would have made a lot of strides, but it means we need everybody hands-on, everybody working together to make sure that this industry lives up to its potential. I believe this is an industry that has the tool, not just for women empowerment, like we've discussed, but at the same time, you talk about Nigeria, where unemployment rate is currently at 24%. You have institutions in place that enables people to be able to develop skills. That means you're creating jobs. You help in tackling the unemployment issue in Nigeria. I believe fashion is a tool that can be used as a driver for the economy in Nigeria and of Africa as a whole. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Was that not just spot on? Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, um, Bemi. And um, thank you for really um, using a case study. And you cannot use any case study for Africa better than Nigeria. It has the, it's the melting pot for, for us Africans. Thank you so much. And um, your points were very spot on, very detailed, very deep. And I think it gave us another perspective, like the full nine yards of what, you know, fashion in Africa and fashion in Nigeria really easy about. We've come to the end of this presentation. Thank you so much, FIT, for hosting us. Thank you so much for everything you're doing to promote fashion in Africa. I know this is not the first. I think we've been here over and over and over. And um, I know it's not going to stop today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Roberta and Nan, for this initiative and the Frelin Group, the Rai Group. And thank you all for coming. and. Um, until the next session, have a wonderful day. <laughs>